rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to worship at Navarre United Methodist Church. I invite you to stand as you are able and join us in singing hymn number 369, Blessed Assurance. the peace by spreading the word of our Lord Jesus. day it is today. So if you would, please turn to hymn number 462. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Yeah. 
As we go to God in prayer. God, we are a culture that wants the quick and easy answers to all of life's problems. We want to be able to open the Bible and place our fingers on the passage that will answer all our questions and heal all our hurts. It is difficult for us to deal with the knowledge that discipleship requires patience and perseverance. Jesus' own disciples struggled with his teachings. It took them a long time to fully understand what Jesus was saying and how they were to respond. We are no different. The words of Jesus take time for us to comprehend. Forgive us, Lord, when we are so impatient, when we just want to get on with it and be where the action is. Help us to understand the commitment we make in discipleship through the rocky times and the smooth times alike. Push us in our ministry of help and compassion to do more than we ever thought we can do in helping others. You know the names of those who are struggling with a host of issues and situations over which we feel powerless. Remind us again that your power is sufficient, your power is sufficient for their needs and they are in your loving care. Give to us this day and every day that extra measure of faith and commitment that we may truly serve you by serving others. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, y'all. We have a few announcements before we begin our sermon this morning, the first of which is the weekend food program orientation. If you would like to volunteer with our weekend food program, which, goes, which is a, a program that helps our, our needy families in this area with food security, uh, the orientation for that is going to be August 29th at 530 in Hildreth Hall. 
It is a fun time, and we get to make a big difference in our community. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we do encourage you to come and to Hildreth for our orientation this Thursday at 530. We also have the Amani Malele Choir coming back in September, on September the 18th, for a concert. And so... Those kids are from Uganda. They're going to be here in our sanctuary that Wednesday night, the 18th at 7 p.m. Uh, and so we do encourage you to come and experience that with us as we worship with people from around the world. We also have a lot of new small groups and old small groups that are still ongoing. And so we encourage you to uh, look at our Get Connected wall out in, the, out in the narthex. We last week had a great launch to share with everyone all that's coming up. And there are so many exciting things coming. Our Wednesday night small groups are going to be coming back online soon. We also have uh, our Sunday evening. We're going to have a Sunday evening Bible study and we're going to be studying the chosen. Uh, so we encourage, if you'd like to be a part of that, it's going to be Sundays from 5 to 7, starting the Sunday after Labor Day. I've had a lot of questions of what day. It's the Sunday after Labor Day. Uh, we don't want anybody to be on vacation when we start. We want everybody to be able to be here. I know how y'all are. So <laughs> we do want to do that. Uh, and we also have our children's choir. On the back of your bulletin, there is a QR code. Amy Pearson and Dawn Zangurley uh, help head up our children's choir they both are phenomenal singers, but they're also trying to bring up the next generation of phenomenal singers. So if you have a child who would like to be a part of our children's choir, we encourage you to scan that, get connected on their Facebook page, and get ready for rehearsals to begin on September the 8th. And that is all the announcements we printed but there is a lot going on in the life of our church. I'd encourage you to follow our Facebook page, and to sign up on your Connect card for our e-news if you haven't already. It will let you know everything that's going on in the life of the church. The bulletin only has so many inches for us to put things on, but the internet is forever. So we can put things out there and let you know what's going on with, with better, better clarity and better longevity. So we do encourage you to do those things. And I also encourage you to fill your Connect card out. If you have anything you need prayer for, if you, uh, we have some youth kids who like to just leave me funny messages. Whatever your heart feels like you need to do with those Connect cards is fine. But we encourage you to let us know, connect with us, let us know how we can be a better church family to each and every one of you. With that, I believe that's all the announcements. Today, we're going to talk about the armor of God. And it's an incredible passage of scripture that Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6. It's an it's a incredible, inspiring piece of scripture. But when I think of the armor of God, I can't help but thinking about uh, the most wonderful time of the year that it has just become. College football is back. Some of you are very upset after yesterday. And thoughts and prayers, I'm an Auburn fan, I've been there, I get it. But the reality is that I always have enjoyed watching football, but I remember the year I played. And I played a couple different ways, but the year I played tackle football was an interesting year because my first day I was given some hand-me-down pads and a helmet and put on my cleats and there were pads everywhere. I felt like I was invincible. I had a rib guard and the shoulder pads, the helmet, all the pads and the legs. I felt like I could run into a brick wall and be just fine. And then in the first drill of my first day of practice, I was paired up with someone who would go on to be a center for the University of Alabama. My dad was laughing after this first drill happened because he said, all you could see of me was the tops of the, my hands and my feet. I was gone. And I remember vividly that moment because I had never been hit that hard before. And I remember laying there going, I think I have made a huge mistake. But thankfully, I got up and kept working and practicing and getting better. And I will not say that I ever bested this man at a hitting drill. I did not. But I will say that after a while, at least it looked like a collision and not just an annihilation. <laughs> but I remember vividly having all those pads on, but I knew nothing about what to do with them. 
I knew nothing about how to take care of myself on the field, on the proper technique of hitting people. I didn't know how to get in stances. I didn't know how to do any of the things that I would learn to do throughout the course of the season. I was just a babe out in the wild. And I think about that when I think about this idea of the armor of God. Sometimes when we're new to faith or maybe if we've walked away from faith and we've just come back to it, the armor of God is ill-fitting. We don't really know what to do with it. We don't know how to embrace this call to be the kind of people who take up this armor. And today, today we're going to talk a little bit about it. But before we read the scripture, we've got to understand what's going on. When Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesians, and honestly, when Paul's writing many of his letters, Paul is not a free man. Paul was arrested uh, several times throughout his ministry. He was snake-bitten, shipwrecked, stoned. Like, he had all kinds of things happen to him that uh, if it happened to one person, it would be crazy, but it happened to him all the time. Like, he was constantly experiencing these crazy things. And as he's writing to people, he's normally writing to them not from a place where his life is easy and peachy keen. He's normally writing to them where he, from a place where he's also facing adversity. But he knows the churches are struggling. He knows the people in the churches who are all new Christians because he had gone out into the Gentile world where people didn't have the benefit of having this Jewish faith to build upon. They were new converts to a religion they knew very little about. He was sending them messages of encouragement and hope because he knew they were going to struggle. Because at this time, Christianity was not very popular. In fact, if it could be... It could be said that it was about as unpopular, especially with the powers and principalities of the world, as it could be. Christianity represented a change in all of human history. Christianity turned everything upside down. It changed the social fabric and the culture of the countries and places that it was starting to take root. Because what happened is Christians would come to faith and they would recognize and be taught that every single person was formed in the image of God, that every single person was of incredible sacred worth, that there were no more dividing lines, that we were all sinners who needed grace. We were all people who were called to sit at the common table of grace. And these early Christian communities, they started a tradition that I feel like we have sometimes let lax, but when they would gather, they would normally share a meal. They would have a covered dish dinner. Imagine that. And they would share this meal together. And in, in many cases, they would meet before the sun even rose. And they would call it a love feast. And they would celebrate Holy Communion. They would spend time together sharing of what they had. And, and it was a change in cultural perspective. Because people from every walk of life were meeting together in the church. Now, these churches weren't grand like this one feels all the time to me. These were homes, maybe alleyways, maybe tents out on the outskirts of town. But they were gathering together because the church truly is the people, not the building. And they were sharing with one another this grace and love that they had been given. And when they did that, it started changing the way the world was working. Because you couldn't, as a Christian, truly think of people as less than you because they were poor or sick or from another country or maybe they didn't live into the social circles that you had previously lived into. You couldn't just disregard their humanity. You couldn't ignore them. And if you were poor, you were not someone who could look up at those who were in positions of power as if they were the devil incarnate and hate them and revile them and revolt against them. There was this place where everyone was being brought together and they were being taught to care for each other and taught each other's hurts and hang-ups and wants. And it started creating social change. And as we have established, if you've never been here before, I am a person who subscribes that human beings are really great at accepting change. We are so good at it. I'm going to change the color of the carpet. How's your blood pressure? No, (laughs) just like that's how we are, right? We don't like change. We like things to be the way they've always been. We like to feel the nostalgia. We like to understand the world we're around. We like to understand how things work. And Christianity was changing things. 
And because it was changing things, the systems that existed in the world did what they always do when change comes. They got mad and they started trying to extinguish the change. Christianity was ostracized. Best case scenario, people in power were just disdainful of it. Worst case scenario, they would feed you to a lion if they found out you were a Christian. There were different levels of persecution that went on across the globe at this time where there were different levels of how different areas treated Christians. Not all places were as bad as others, but it did get bad. And to call yourself a Christian, to publicly proclaim it, was to put yourself in a precarious position because the Roman leadership wasn't a huge fan of Christianity at the time either. Jesus was executed the way political people who would try to lead a rebellion against Rome were executed. It was very much a statement that y'all should not be doing this. And so Paul, as he's writing to people, is writing to them in the midst of these new Christians who are struggling and experiencing hardship because of their faith. And Ephesians 6, beginning with verse 10, says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against authority, the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, that when I speak, a message may be given to me, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This scripture is incredibly powerful to me. And it's powerful because as I read it, I can't help but think of how encouraging it must have been for these people who are reading it to hear Paul cheering them on because they were facing all of this struggle. But as I read it, I like to think about Paul as if he was writing this letter to me today. I understand it's important as a biblical scholar to put things in their context, and we did that already. But what would Paul be writing to us about Today, what spiritual forces of wickedness or wiles of the devil? I grew up in the Deep South. One of my favorite junior high school teachers used to say when we were acting up, y'all are letting the wiles of the devil win today. And and then they wouldn't win because she wasn't going to let that happen. Uh, But (laughs) it was always interesting to think about this idea of what are the wiles of the devil today. Because if we're honest, the church is not really persecuted in our country the way it might be in other places in the world. Now, we might have some negative social commentary from time to time. We might have people talk bad about us, and that's okay. Jesus said, blessed are you when people revile you in my name. Like we, but we don't have people coming and locking our doors and telling us we can't meet. We don't have people making us lose our jobs or putting us in prison for our faith. And so when I think about it, we kind of have had a long period of relative comfort as Christians in the world when we really think about the history of Christianity, especially in the United States. And I think about that, and I think about, well, what other ways would the spiritual forces of wickedness, or, as I grew up, the devil, 
what ways might the devil tempt us now? And I think that it's a little bit more subtle now. In our modern age, we have been given the gift of instantaneous communication. But we have not been given the ability to instantaneously communicate well. How often do you say something or hear something that someone else has said where you read or you read something on whatever social media app you prefer and you look at it and go, I don't know if I'd have said that. How often do you have to hit the delete button as you're typing out your venom in a text message? I have a rule that I've been teaching the youth kids. Whenever you're angry at somebody, do not type it in Messenger, type it in the Notes app. Then let it go for an hour and a half. Read it again. If you're still angry, put it down again. Don't read it again until you're calm. When you read it that time, understand that whatever's written there probably needs to be heavily edited. Because very often we're so quick to lash out. And I'd like to tell you that that's a youth kid issue, but I think that our youth kids communicate better than our adults do at times. But we should know better. We also live in a divided world where we have been able to make glorious mountains out of molehills. Where we have decided that there needs to be a side for every issue. And that there is no room for someone to have a period of discernment. That we have to choose a side, stand on that side, and point at everyone on the other side and go, you're wrong. You know what I've learned in my 37 years on this earth? I will never agree completely with anyone. And if I decide to divide myself and to be against everyone who is ever against me, I'm going to be the loneliest human being on the planet. Because I can find a way to disagree with everyone. If you don't believe me, ask Brittany. I'm very contrarian. And as I think about that, I think about how this comfort that we have and this ease of just separating ourselves from others, because culturally we've made it easy. In most homes, you can, you can hit a button when you get into your neighborhood, if you're close enough to your house, your garage door will open. You can drive past all the people you can't stand on your street. You can turn into your home, pull into your garage, hit the button, and the world goes away. And then you can walk in and turn on windows to the world we call television and cultivate only things that you want to see in the world around you. You can limit your perspective as much as you want. And we wonder why people can't find common ground. One of the things I love about the neighborhood I live in is all the kids play at my house. That does cost a lot in flavor ice popsicles. And it probably costs a lot in home maintenance and repair because those kids are wild. But I get to meet the parents. And I get to experience my neighbors. And every now and then I get posted about on Facebook, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively, and I laugh every time. Because it's interesting how we've lost our ability to develop community, but when we start trying, it develops so quickly. But Paul, when he's writing to this, this letter to the Ephesians, he's trying to encourage them to live into a faith community and into a personal faith that is able to withstand the hardships that are going to come. Because there's one constant that is going to always happen in life is you're going to face some adversity you're going to face some struggles. You're going to face some difficult things. The question is not whether you're going to face them. The question is, how are you going to face them? Paul gives us these tools. And he starts with the belt of truth. Now, as a kid, I grew up in a very religious household, and I grew up fearful of the belt of truth. I wasn't spanked that much, but it only took one time for me to understand that, oh my goodness, the belt of truth can be a terrible thing. But as I reflect on the belt of truth as an adult, as I think about what this belt of truth is, 
and this scripture, what is the truth we cling to? What is the truth that we as Christians have been given? What is the truth that defines who we are? And I think that there are two scripture verses that I, I like to use when I'm trying to define the truth of who Christians are. One of them is very popular, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know I said it fast, but you've heard it before, right? That scripture's held up at every sporting event ever. That scripture's powerful. It tells us the truth of who we are in Christ, that we have been given salvation if we just believe. And if we choose to be believers, we are the redeemed. We are those who have been given salvation. And the second scripture is the Great Commission, that go now and make disciples of all ages, nations, and races, go out into the world and share my world, share my view, bring people back to me. It's this idea that we're people who are saved for a purpose. We're saved and we're given this, great, this gift of grace and salvation from God, but we're also called to see the world as God sees it, to see the world and everyone outside of the faithful as people who are of incredible worth, of incredible value, particularly to our God who is sending us out to reach them. So we are called not only to be seen by God as good and as people who have been redeemed, but we're called to see the world as God sees it as a world filled with people who may not know the goodness of God yet, but it's our job to carry it to them. So when we talk about truth, those are some big truths, right? We have a job to do as people who have been redeemed. And so there's this nature that we all have where we, we struggle with this, but at the core of who we are, those two truths are very important. It sets the tone for all the things that we do. Now, there are other truths in the Bible. There are a lot of truths in the Bible that we need to live into, but those two are the starting points for all of them. Then we have the breastplate of righteousness. This is where some of those other truths come into play. How many of you have been righteous before, right? Righteous literally means right act. It's this idea that we act correctly that we behave ourselves in a particular way. Many of the biblical truths about how we're called to behave are taught secularly in kindergarten. We should share. We should be kind to our friends. When our friends are having a bad day, we should forgive them. There are many things that we learn in kindergarten that somewhere along the way, by the time we hit about 30, evaporate. But we're called to live into this idea of being righteous. Now, righteous does not always mean that we think we're better than anyone else. In fact, righteousness also has an element of humility. It doesn't mean we know something better than anyone else. Because I can go and tell you, I can behave like a four-year-old with the best of them. But I think about this idea of what, it, what calls us to be righteous. And Jesus he constantly encouraged his disciples to follow him, to come and see, and then to be as he was. It was this idea that he was like, I will show you the right way if you'll just pay attention and follow. And so this exciting scripture about having this breastplate of righteousness, it doesn't mean necessarily that we are always perfect, but it does mean that we're always reflecting on what would God have us do in a particularly tough moment. In my life, I've not met many people who I thought were perfect, but I've met a few. When I was a little boy, there was a sweet, mature lady who every Sunday morning had the best cookies. And I would go see her immediately when she got on campus because I was going to make sure that she paid the cookie tax to come to church. That was Kind of my thing. She always had to deal with me. She said, come see me. I'll give you one before I put them out on the hospitality table. It was great. It was a good racket. But she was also one of the most kind people I had ever met. She volunteered a lot with children and youth. But she also sat on all the church councils. She was one of those who... who no matter what happened, she was going to be nominated to be on something. And there was a reason for that. And it's because she never really lost her temper. 
And I remember when she was talking to us as a confirmation class about spiritual maturity, I remember looking at her and going, why don't you get angry? And she looked at me and she says, I do. And I said, you get angry? She says, yes. And I said, well, how come we never see it? Because I've seen you around us when we were doing things that should have made you angry. How come you're so calm? She goes, have you ever noticed that I hum a hymn when y'all are being bad? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, have you ever known that I will take a deep breath before I speak? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, have you ever noticed that my voice is just quieter when y'all are behaving, misbehaving? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, I've learned that that goes a lot farther than me ranting, raving, and losing my temper and losing control of myself. That if I would just behave in a way that I wish y'all would behave, that very often I will get the response I want. And what was amazing to me was I watched her do it to full-grown adults too. In committee meetings, when things got too wild, she would say, now, friends, we're at church. Let's remember why we're here. And she would take the temperature down in the midst of a disagreement. We would all remember we loved each other, and we'd be able to do the work of the church, smooth things out. Righteousness matters. It doesn't mean that we don't have all the same emotions that everyone else has. We will. Lord knows, I can get angry. But what we use those feelings to do matters. How we act, how we use what God has given us matters. So we're called to be righteous. And then we're called, as Christine says, to put on our good news boots. That's what she calls the shoes of spiritual peace. And I love that because A, it's catchy, and B, it just makes sense. Because when I think of boots, I think of people who are getting ready for a journey. And one of the things that Paul tells us is that whatever shoes we might wear, whether they're your good news boots or we're in Florida, your good news flip-flops, we're called to carry our faith with us. We're called to carry the good news of Christ with us. We're called to share our faith. To carry our faith, not only how we handle situations, but to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people around us. To share how we manage those things. To take opportunities to witness to people who are struggling in the moment and letting them in on the secret of how we handle things a little differently. How we go to God in prayer. How we lean on our small groups. How we lean on our church. How we call on one another to help us support each other and tell people about what God has done in our lives. We're called to carry that with us. Because I would argue the biggest failing of the church in modern history is that people are really religious for only set hours in the week. And then when they go out in the world, it's like they don't know God. Our faith is not something we attend to for an hour or two on Sunday mornings and maybe for a couple hours on Wednesday nights. Our faith is something we live every day. It goes with us. It's supposed to color in every facet of our life and change who we are, not just at home, but out in the world. Not just in worship, but out with God's people. And so then we're called to not only have these good news boots, but we're also called to have the shield of faith. Faith is one of those things that's tough to quantify. But I can tell you that the people that I have met with the most faith are the people who put the most into their faith. Very seldom have I met someone of tremendous faith, if ever, who's never prayed, never read their Bible, never gone to worship, never been in a small group, never done the normal things that it takes to be a part of faithfulness. Earlier we talked about me getting destroyed by uh, a guy on a football field. Well, of course I was going to get destroyed. I'd never practiced. If you have very little faith, the reality is that you are likely to struggle even more when something hard comes your way. 
The goal that we're supposed to have as followers of Christ is that we're supposed to grow our faith. We're supposed to be the kind of people who are committed to our personal journey in Christ. Yes, we have brothers and sisters in Christ sitting all around us, but we're called to be the kind of people who spend time in the spiritual disciplines. We're called to study our Bible. I encourage all of you, read the Bible, so that way if I'm not telling the truth, you know. I would much rather argue with you about theological points than me say something about the Bible and you go, that's good enough for me. Read your Bible. Pray. Pray constantly. There's this idea that we're meant to be the kind of people who pray so much that it intervenes in the hardest moments of our life. Pray when you're angry. My dad taught me as a little boy that I was supposed to pray for people that made me angry and I was supposed to pray nice things. He made me pray out loud for them so he knew I was doing it right instead of just praying they'd stub their toe or something. He said, I want you to pray good things for the people who are harming you. And he said, I want you to do that all week long and then I want you to tell me at the end of the week, are you still angry at that person? And what I can tell you is if you pray for those who are a thorn in your side, what you end up having for them is empathy. You end up realizing that they're of incredible sacred worth just as you are. You're able to open your eyes to the fact that maybe their experience in the world is different than yours. Maybe there are things that are triggering the negativity that they're giving you. And you stop hating and start loving. Because God's weird that way. When you truly and earnestly pray good for even those who are your enemies. Our faith can change us, can change our perspective. And as we work on our faith, as we show up to worship, as we pray, as we study our scripture, as we join a small group, as we continue to work and serve in the world, as we carry our faith out with us, as we practice our faith, our faith grows and our shield gets bigger. But when we quit working on it, it starts getting old and rusty and it stops being maintained. And like that kid on first day of football practice, when we get walloped, we're on our back and they can just see our hands and our feet. But when we work on our faith, it grows. And what's truly amazing is when we work on our faith in the, in the midst of a church family is that the shield is even bigger because we have the shield of our own and the shield of the people to the right and to our left and behind us and before us because we're never walking through a problem by ourselves. We have people. We have resources. We have hope. But you've got to have the shield of faith. And it says that's the only way you're going to withstand the fiery arrows of the evil one. And then we're called to have the sword or the helmet of salvation. We'll go to that one first. The helmet of salvation. To keep on our football allegory, last year we bought as a church, thank you all for your generosity, guardian helmet covers for all of our high school students who play football at Navarre High School. It decreases the amount of concussions they have tremendously throughout the season and protects the brains of our young people, which I would argue is a very good thing. When you have the helm of salvation, that guardian helmet cover, it can preserve you from a lot of things that nothing else can. Salvation is a gift we've all been given. And Jesus tells us whatever is in the hand of God cannot be torn away. We cannot be taken away from God. And so there's this idea that our salvation is the thing that we're called to cling to when things really are really, really bad. Because at the end of the day, no matter what happens to our physical bodies, we are in the hand of God. And what's incredible about people of tremendous faith throughout history is that even when their mortal flesh was taken by the evil one or by the spiritual forces of wickedness in the world, faith endured and grew. When Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, civil rights did not end. It went into another gear. When Dietrich Bonhoeffer was martyred by Nazi Germany. A little-known scholar and theologian became a worldwide inspiration of what it meant to be faithful. And his writings became studied by people from all over as this man who suffered and was brutally murdered showed people what it looked like to be a person of faith without fear, even in the midst of tremendous evil. And hope was inspired. 
in the ancient church when they tried to persecute the church and kill people throughout all of their persecutions, one of the things that was overwhelming were the number of people who refused to refute their faith. If you read the ancient history of the church, there's all kinds of miracles that are told about where lions would just close their mouths and not harm people. There were also stories of people who died. And what was amazing was that as these rulers were thinking they were extinguishing the light of Christ and extinguishing the movement of Christianity, it only added fuel to the flame. As people said, if people have that kind of conviction that their God is real and is with them and that nothing that this world can do to them will overcome their God, then I want to experience that. The helm of salvation helps us deal with fear. Because at the end of the day, God has us. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear that God will not be with us because God will be. No matter what may come, God will be with us. I'm grateful we live in a country where we are free to worship, but God is with the faithful. And if God is with us, nothing can stand against us. And finally, Jesus through his apostle Paul, gives us the word of God, the sword, the spirit. It's this idea, have you ever met somebody that's a Bible thumper? You ever met those people? They're fun. I like Bible thumpers a lot. They quote Bible at you for every single issue that you ever have in your life, ever. And if they're really excellent, they can make you feel like a terrible person with scripture verses all the time. You ever met those people? They're some of my favorite people. And they're some of my favorite people because Reformed Bible thumpers are the best biblical teachers you will ever meet. Because they take Scripture seriously. They believe in Scripture and the power of Scripture. And if you can ever get them to, to move themselves to a different orientation where they're building up instead of tearing down, they become the most excellent teachers of Scripture you have ever been around. And I can tell you that because... I had an old colonel that used to teach Bible at a church and he had been a Bible thumper and had gone on a spiritual retreat and after that retreat he had recognized that he had been tearing people down and said he wanted to use scripture to build people up. So instead of tearing people down and quoting scripture when they did something bad, he reinforced good behavior with scripture. Used it as a blessing, not a curse. And what was amazing was we were always looking as young men and women for that blessing from that colonel. Because he would tell us how what we had done was a part of what the kingdom of heaven wanted us to do. But as a United Methodist, we take scripture very seriously. We think that everybody should be a part of it. I told you earlier, read your Bible. I mean it. Read your Bible. In our modern age, our biblical literacy is less than, than generations before us. When it's easier to have access to a Bible than it ever has been in history. You pull out your phone, you can download a free Bible app. The Gideons have Bibles translated in all kinds of languages. They have a Bible app with all kinds of translations. If you don't want a free translation, if you want a Bible of your very own, you can go on Amazon and type in Bible, and there's going to be roughly 14 million copies of Bibles out there that you can purchase and have delivered to your home in two days with free prime shipping. I have another one just like this one, so that way when the scripture starts falling out of it, I don't have to change translations because we can be picky. But we actually have to read it. We have to listen to the truths that scripture offer us. We have to reflect on how they impact our lives. We have to think about what God is doing for us, and when we're facing adversity, we should spend more time with the word of God. Seeking the wisdom that God has given us. Seeking to know how we are called to live into the call of faithfulness that's placed in our lives. This armor of God that Paul talks about, it's an incredible call for all of us to attend to our faith. Because the job we have been given is an incredibly important one. We have been called to spread the good news. We've been called to tell people of the God who has saved each and every one of us. We have been called to be ambassadors for Christ. And the best way we do that is to do our very best job at being people of faith. At being the living saints, the living body 
of Christ in the world. When we get that right, good things happen. We see lives transformed. We see help for those who are hurting. We see joy where there was once mourning. We see hope where there was hopelessness. Today, after this service, we're going to go to the beach and we have two baptisms. One kid, one youth. They've been coming to our church for a while and they've decided that they want to be a part of what God is doing because they're inspired by the work our church has done. They want their faith to be made real. But they're also watching all of us. They're wanting to see what it looks like for a life to be well lived in faith. So we as a body of Christ have to put on the full armor of God. We have to be willing to be transformed and strengthened by our faith and by God's spirit. And to be willing to stand in the gap when things are hard. To be the kind of church and the kind of Christians who when we see evil in the world are willing to stand up against it. To do all that we can and be all that we can for the sake of the kingdom of God. Friends, when we do that, especially when we decide to work together, there isn't much we can't accomplish. We can do anything. We can do incredible things. But if we're not careful, we can also do nothing. I think that we should be the kind of people old Paul would be proud of ready and willing to serve and to face down the evil that exists in this world and to overcome it with good, with mercy, and with faithfulness. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and gather and worship, to be renewed, to experience your word in this place, to sing your songs, and to pray to you. We pray that you would strengthen our spirit that you would help us to be the kind of people who go out into the world as people on a mission for you, seeking to serve you, to love you, to love one another, and to make a difference for the sake of your kingdom. We ask this all in your holy name. Amen. You're able and as forgiven and reconciled people, let us profess our faith together using the words of the historic Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to the time in our service where we have the privilege to give back to God a portion of what God has given to us. I invite our ushers to come forward as we present to God his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. God, the whole earth is full of your glory and we are in awe of your majesty. You give us gifts and invite us to go into the world to tell your good news. Help us to respond in faith and go where you lead us each day. We dedicate our gifts so that our community will grow grow closer to you. Amen.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. In hope. bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one
praise Him, all creatures here below. Please turn to, that's what these are for. Ah, numbers and words. If you would, please turn to him at number 328, surely the presence of the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in his place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence. I see glory. 